Hi, I'm Mr. Ramsey. I teach fourth grade at Bridgeport Elementary. Today we're learning how living things change with Mr. Croslin, our special guest. Hey, thanks for the introduction. You know, today's lesson is going to be pretty interesting because we're going to study how plants and animals and people have changed the environment where living things are. And to do that, on your worksheet, we've divided up into how some plants, some animals, and some activities of people. Now, I know that you've probably never heard of the plant called the kudzu. After today, you will. You may never heard of the purple loose strife. After today, you will. Those are two plants that have had a big impact on our environment. Some of the animals we're gonna talk about, the zebra mussel, the Asian carp, the emerald ash borer, a Canadian goose. Now, all of these that I've just mentioned are a special type of creature. They were not from Indiana. They were brought here by accident or on purpose, and we call that, anybody know what that's called? What? Invasive species. They're called invasive species. They've invaded. And when they come here to invade, they're like, man, I love this place. Look, I'm just going to grow like crazy because nothing's going to stop me. Because where they came from, there were predators or prey or abiotic factors that said, slow down. The zebra mussel came from Europe. There were other things that would eat that. The Asian carp came from way on the other side of the world. The emerald ash borer came from China. The Canadian goose, where do you think it came from? Canada. Canada. And I'll tell you, the kudzu came from South America. A lot of these people brought in to try to do something good, but then it really messed up. That's one thing we're going to do. We're going to take a look at these. We're also going to make two worlds. We're going to probably do that first. Now you're thinking, we're going to make some worlds? Yes. We're going to make a world in a cup. You can go ahead and draw this on the back. This one's going to be world A, and this is going to be world B. You say, in a world? Yeah, we're going to do it, put an animal. We're going to put an animal here. We're going to grow an animal that lives really quick. Anybody know what animal could live in a cup? Thousands of them? Silver ants. Silver ants. Oh, that's going to be a good idea. Yeah, what do you think? Fish. Fish. Oh, I love fish. But a thousand of them, not in a cup. Here's the animal. They look like this. Under a microscope, they even look better. Yeast. What? Yeast. We're going to try something called yeast. <laughs> and we're going to set that up. We're going to set that up. It's called yeast. And we're going to try to grow yeast. We're going to put some water in one and some vinegar in one. So one's gonna get water, one's gonna get vinegar. Oh, I love vinegar, but I don't know if yeast loves vinegar. Mm -hmm. We'll find out. One of them is gonna get water. One, I'm not gonna tell you which one's pollution. You're gonna to have to say. But let me tell you a little bit about yeast. Yeast love three things. They like a liquid, so we got the liquid, right? They need sugar. So we're gonna put sugar in each one of these. Now let's put a spoon of sugar. Would it be fair in A cup to put a big jump bunch of sugar and in B you only put a little bit of sugar? Would that be fair? No. no. Let's put the same amount. One spoon of sugar in A, one spoon of sugar in B. And I have some extra cups we'll pull the sugar into. All right, next, yeast. Let's put a half a spoon of yeast in A. Would it be fair to put two spoons of yeast in B? How much yeast should we put in B? Same amount. Same amount. We're going to control the variables. Half a spoon of yeast. Now, if these worlds work, if a, a yeast is an animal, and if a yeast is happy, you know what yeast gives off as it grows? Yeah. A gas. And you know what that gas is called? Carbon. Yep, carbon. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide CO2. Mm -hmm. So if the yeast is happy in happy world, we're going to get bubbles. And the happier it is, the more bubbles. If the yeast is happy in B world, hey, let's take a closer look at this.
Okay, we... How can pollution affect organism? How can pollution affect organism? Go ahead, Kasim. Add 30 milliliters of water to cup A. Okay. So you see what he's doing, because you guys are going to do this. 30 milliliters. And that is an instrument called a... Cylinder. Everybody, it's called a cylinder. Okay, 30 milliliters of water to cup A. The same, what's the next direction? Add one spoonful of, wait, sorry. Add three milliliters of vinegar <laughs> to cup B. All right. You're trying to trick Mr. Ramsey, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is good that both liquids are the same amount, right? Yes. Is he telling him when to stop? Is that all right? Check, confirm that with someone else, Mr. Ramsey. He's trying to, he's trying to trick us, isn't he? <laughs> yep. What do you think? <laughs> That's all right. And I have one more person confirm it. Okay, it's good. What is that, young lady? Uh, what? Wait a minute. Is that? Is it where you're shaking your head, or what is it? No, no, it has too much. Yeah, it has too much. <laughs> Maybe one less milliliter. Ding! Look at that. Now confirm it. What do you think? Yes. Yes, good. Where does that go? Perfect. In the cup, 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 cup B. Cup B. Here we go. B. Cup B. Your directions are superb, young man. Continue. Thank you. And add one spoonful of sugar and one, one half spoonful of yeast to both cups. Okay, so stop, stop, stop. Let's do it one at a time. One spoon. Is it, should he make a giant spoon in one and a small spoon in the other? Small. Small. The same, right? Yes. Sugar in A. Is that the same amount? Confirm it, somebody. What do you think? It's yes. the same amount. Yes. Same amount. Sugar in B. And here comes the critters. Now, they are not living so much right now. They're kind of suspended. It's called <laughs> yeast. Here comes half a spoon of yeast. <laughs> Those yeasts are going to be so happy. I know, right? Some of them are. But some of them are going to be so sad. I wonder which ones. All right, continue with the last direction. What did it say right after you added that? Stir gently. Stir gently. Okay, if the yeast is happy, what will it do? Bubbles. It will start to make? Bubbles. Of? Gas. Gas. But now we need to keep it warm. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to go back to our seats. We're going to do this, follow the directions. And would you uh, uh, maybe... We can have someone read those again. Me. Let me give you guys a chance to get everything caught up. I'll see you in just a few minutes. So to recap, what are we doing, young man? We are going to put 30 millimeters, I mean, millimeters in. 30 milliliters in A. A. We're going to put water in A, 30 milliliters in A, and... 30 millimeters in and B. But instead of putting water in B, we're going to put vinegar in there. Then what are you going to do? We're going to add sugar to both of them. How much sugar are you going to put in? The, the same amount. And what is that amount? A, ha a spoonful. A spoonful, not a shovel full, right. not a bucket full, <laughs> and not a truck full, right? <laughs> That'd be too much of anything in the environment. Hey, great job. What are you waiting on? Get busy, everybody. Okay, so now that we got the sugar, let's add the special ingredients that's going to start this world going. And this is yeast, and I love the smell of yeast. Wait till you get it. Some people like it. Yeah. Some people don't. <laughs> but um, we're going to put a half a teaspoon. Now, you might wonder what yeast is good for. Why do we want it to be filled with bubble CO2? Well, I'll tell you why. Everybody wants you to take a look at, at this. You know what this is? Bread. 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 Duh, who doesn't know bread, right? <laughs> Here, pass some down. You can tear it in half so everybody gets a piece. Pass some down. But I want you to take a look at this bread. Bread has all of these 
little bubbles. The part that makes bread soft is that, let me tell you how to make bread, son. Come here. You take some flour, right? Mm -hmm. Say yes. Get a little bit of salt, right? Mm -hmm. Put some water, right? Maybe some yes. baking soda. And then you add the magic living ingredient. You know what you add? Uh, yeast. Yeast. And you crunch it all up, and the yeast is starting to say, this is good. Get over here, kid. <laughs> they're, they're saying that the yeast is good. But you know what happens to this yeast? Look at your bread. Everybody look at your bread. There's these little bubbles. When the yeast starts to grow, it gives off CO2 gas. And the bread now gets nice and fluffy. The dough does. But here's the bad news. Just when the yeast is having this great life in the bread dough and getting bigger and bigger, along comes the baker. You know what the baker does? To uh, put in the oven. I know, it's terrible. Dun, 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 dun. I'm on fire. No, it's like, are you kidding me? Just when I had a good life, <laughs> it gets so hot that all the yeast is killed and all these bubbles are trapped. CO2 bubbles are trapped in the bread. Look at your bread. Those are what's the leftover remains of the CO2 in the case of the burned yeast. Go ahead, let's take a closer look at this. Can you guys see the small bubbles in it? Yeah. And that's what the yeast is used for. Hey, does anybody like the flat bread? Yeah. Guess what, it does not have, yeast. and it's not very puffy, is it? There you go, perfect. Um, and okay, pass it on. And stir gently. If you do a little more than half in one, you should put the same amount in the other. Go ahead. And stir gently past the yeast. What are you doing with your science experiment? You're eating the bread? <laughs> you must like yeast. Do me a favor, don't eat these two worlds, okay? Okay. Okay, so we have two worlds. A world has sugar, yeast, warm water. B world has sugar, yeast, vinegar. Now what I'd like you to do is we're going to write some notes and take some uh, notes on, on these animals, plants up here. So in your non-writing hand, let's hold the bottom of this to get it warm. So everybody, if, you write, if you're right-handed, hold this in your left. I write with my right hand. So one of you hold one and your partner holds one, okay? Let's set that up. Okay, while we're waiting for our yeast world to do its thing, let's talk about some of these. And for example, the kudzu is a plant that was brought in this country to stop erosion. The problem is when they planted it, it has grown everywhere. Check this out. If you take a look at this, kudzu has overgrown everything. Mr. Uh, Ramsey, look in the middle of that one right there. There's a house that's been covered up. One up. There you go. Uh, that is actually a house, boys and girls. I don't know if you can see that or not. And if you go down to the right, there's uh, more. There is a picture of kudzu completely covering over the barn. And there's even a picture down bottom of a school bus that there's a, that's been covered a little bit further down. Kudzu, it just grows over everything. Every bump you see right there was a tree or a bush that used to be alive. Is it alive now? No. Kudzu, a good thing in the environment or a bad thing? Bad. Here's the second invasive species that were, that's in your book. What a beautiful, what a beautiful plant. Purple loose stripe. Trouble is, it's an invader. It came into this country, it looks nice, but every one of these plants is taking the place of another native plant that used to be here. So, you either die, move, or suffer when another plant comes into your environment. And this thing is really good at reproducing. Let's take another look at another one. This is a zebra mussel. It's not very big, about the size of your little finger. But look what happens when it's in the Great Lakes. It loves to stick on things and reproduce. Here is a fishing pole they found in the water. It's covered with them. Here's a pier, a clam. Here's a propeller. 
Is that a good thing to have in our water? No. It came over by accident, and now we're trying to get rid of this invasive species. Let's look at another one. Okay, this is a fish that's actually in the Wabash River in Indiana. It started coming up the Mississippi River and a lot of rivers. Now, it looks like it's fun. This is an Asian carp that they brought in this country to eat grass to keep our waterways clear. But when the floods came, this escaped into our rivers. Now, these people are having some fun trying to shoot them with bows and arrows. There are so many of them. And how do they escape predators where they're from in Asia? When they hear something, they jump out of the water. But these weigh three or four pounds. Now, this looks like it's kind of fun. This guy gets hit in the head a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That looks like it's fun. But really, it's not. You could get hurt. And the bad news is there are thousands and thousands. If these get into our Great Lakes, it's going to ruin our fishing up there. We have all kinds of fantastic native fish, the Asian carp. I guess the only way we're going to stop them, we can either poison them, net, electrocute them, or catch them and eat them. The Asian carp. It looks like it's fun but it's not fun for the fish and plants that live there. Of course, I wouldn't want to be on the river with a guy shooting a bow and arrow either. <laughs> I don't think so. Let's take a look at one more. This one is really going to have a bad impact on the forests of Indiana. It's called the emerald ash borer. It's not very big. Mr. Ramsey goes down a little bit. You can see it's about the size of, it's smaller than a penny. And it's emerald. And it's an ash borer. The ash is the tree that it loves. Now, scientists have found, in fact, one of the head scientists is from Purdue University who's studying this all over the country. It came to this country in wood from a shipping pallet. You know what a pallet is? Like when you put a bunch of boxes from China of shoes and shirts and clothes, they put it on a boat and they put it on a wood pallet. The pallet landed in Detroit, Michigan. They took the stuff off. They threw the wood pallet in a pile. Who knew? Inside of the wood pallet, let's go down a little bit, or uh, there was an egg. This emerald ash borer had la laid eggs. The eggs had hatched down into larva caterpillars, and the larva were eating the bark. They eat so much bark that it kills the tree. One out of 10 trees in Indiana might be killed by the emerald ash borer. Hey, right here, close to you, not a, only a mile away at Chapel Glen Elementary, I took the kids on a walk where they had to cut down 40 giant trees that had already been killed by the emerald ash borer. Good thing, bad thing? Bad. 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 You want all the trees to die? <laughs> bad. And know what? you know what? It's going to cost a lot of money to get rid of this. So people buying clothes and shipping, we weren't careful. We let this invader in. I got one more to show you. Hey, before we see our last invasive species, now this one might be a surprise to you. Let's take a look up close at your yeast world. Okay, I'm looking at these. I'm seeing which ones are bubbling the most. Can anybody tell? Stop stirring. We don't stir anymore. We're just going to let them go. Oh, look at this one. B, not many bubbles. A, lots of bubbles. We'll check back in a few minutes on these. All right, you're not going to believe this last animal I'm talking about. Maybe you've seen it. I remember about 20 years ago at my school, Chapel Glen, we looked out the window, and there, right in front of the school, was the biggest Canadian goose I've ever seen. It was so cool. I got all the kids, look, a Canadian goose is here. We went out, we drew pictures of it, we read about it. We learned that, you know how they change to winter? They change from going, when it gets cold, what does a Canadian goose do, like many birds? Migrate, doesn't hibernate, bears hibernate, it migrate. So migration is when a animal responds to the stimulus of winter. Now, some animals hibernate. So the Canadian goose, so we looked at this goose, it was so cool. The next week, there were two. We thought, wow. Next year, there were four. We were so happy. 15, 20 years later, there are hundreds. In fact, do you have them here? Yes. And when you go out to recess, what's all over the, uh, yeah, the feces, the excrements everywhere? Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that. Let me tell you the reason. You see, a long time ago, we had a lot of, sprayed a lot of chemicals to kill bugs that farmers didn't like, and people didn't like. 
We didn't know though that those bugs, other birds were eating them. And there was a scientist named Rachel Carson, you can learn more about her. She wrote a book called Silent Spring. Because she said if we keep using these chemicals to kill bugs, the next springtime, there won't be any birds left. In fact, what was happening, birds were sitting down on their eggs to get them warm, and their eggs were being crushed and the birds were dying. So they stopped that, and they thought, you know, we need to bring some Canadian geese back. So scientists raised Canadian geese and let them loose here in Indiana. This is so cool, we got our geese back. Problem, migration is a learned behavior. And when they hatched those geese out and put them in our, around here, the geese grew up, they swam in our ponds, they ate the leftover corn in our cornfields. Winter time came, they just found a warm place to live around here. Springtime came, they had a bunch of babies, no predators. They didn't go back to Canada where there's fox, wolf, weasels. They didn't migrate down to Alabama and Tennessee where there's coyotes and foxes. They stayed here. Hey, it's cool in Indiana. And then guess what? They don't migrate anymore. So now every year we have more and more Canadian geese. That is what happens when we interrupt it. Now I'll tell you, you may have seen a movie about a scientist and his daughter. You know what he did? They hatched out some geese. They put a glove on so it looked like a goose. So that baby never thought of a human as a friend. They raised them and then he got a hang glider and you know what he made it in the shape of and the color of? A big giant goose. It's kind of like Father Goose. He got on the plane, took off and flew and the geese flew with him and he landed. He did that for like a week. So now the geese would follow him. Guess what he did next? When it turned winter time, started to get cold in it here, he flew south. His babies went with him. Then he flew farther south. His babies went with him. And he flew farther south. He taught them to migrate. Those geese now teach their babies to migrate. So that's one solution. But here's the problem. There are thousands and thousands of geese that have never migrated. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Bad. Why? Well, there's a name for that. It's called overpopulation. Let's take a look at one more thing. So here's some images of the Canadian goose. And if you see them up in the winter, those are ones that know how to migrate. And then some that don't migrate. They're beautiful creatures. I just wish they were more wild and would migrate. All right, let's take a look at one more thing. This is a world population clock. It shows how many people were born today in the world. 226,000. Yeah. It tells how many people have died today, 94,000. So are there more people being born or dying each day? Born. In fact, we're growing. Here's how many people are on our planet right now by best estimates. 7.4 billion people. Remember the emerald ash borer? Remember the geese? Do you think there'll ever be a time when there's too many people? Yes. No. Yes. yes. I don't know. But the more people, the more the environment has to change. And I just want to share this with you. Now, do I, do I say that we go get rid of everybody? No. no. <laughs> we like babies. <laughs> we, you know, but our population is growing. That's why you need science to find ways that we can live together with our environment. All right, let's take one more look at our yeast. We're looking at the results of our yeast experiment, and between A and B, there is a difference. Something is happening in B. Dora, do you see some of the bubbles in there? Dora, what are those bubbles caused from? Carbon dioxide. Ah, carbon dioxide. And that is in which one, Mr. Ramsey? That's in cup A. And Mary, do you see any of those bubbles in cup B? No. No. Something happened over here that's different. What would you say is different about cup A? Is this evidence of life here, if there you see carbon dioxide? Yeah. Very cool. So, check it out, see if you agree. Look at yours. Wow, what a lesson. We packed a lot into this lesson about how animals respond to changes in their environment. You know, it's not all bad. For example, I want you to look up the beaver. The beaver turns a stream 
into a pond, into a meadow, and changes the environment so a lot of other animals can live there. So we have some ecological engineers. So not all animals that move in are bad. Hey, this has been a great lesson. Before I go, I'm gonna show you one more thing. I want you to take a look at these notes one of the students took here. Her name is, is uh, well, I'll let you tell her what happened, but one of the great notes. She was our videographer. Hi, my name is Jillian Harris, and I was forced to make this video. <laughs> That's all right.